This video provides an overview of cardiac arrest rhythms and how we manage them according to the 2020 ACLS algorithms, especially in an EMS setting. I divide this, just as the AHA does on the cardiac arrest algorithms, into two parts, shockable and non-shockable. This is part two, non-shockable rhythms. The non-shockable rhythms are asystole and those rhythms that we classify as pulseless electrical activity, or PEA. By definition, asystole means without systole, and we are specifically referring to ventricular systole, which is identified by the lack of any recognizable electrical or mechanical activity coming from the ventricles. Asystole and PEA, which I will discuss shortly, are managed under the same branch of this algorithm because our treatment options are identical. However, it's important to keep asystole in perspective. Asystole represents a complete lack of electrical activity in the ventricles and should be primarily viewed as a confirmation of death rather than a rhythm to be resuscitated. If we determine that resuscitation should be attempted, our treatment options for asystole are very simple. We do CPR, establish IV access, give one milligram of epinephrine as early as possible, and we repeat it every three to five minutes during our two minute cycles of CPR. We can consider an advanced airway, but we should also be seriously evaluating the appropriateness of resuscitation at all in asystole. Quickly determine the pulsed or DNR status, the downtime prior to CPR, and other details relevant to making a decision regarding terminating resuscitation. Pulseless electrical activity, or PEA on the other hand, is the term we use when we see an organized rhythm on the monitor that produces no palpable pulse. Remember that you do not put VTAC without a pulse in this category. While it meets the technical definition of electrical activity with no pulse, we treat it the same as VFib because we know it is likely to respond to defibrillation. PEA can present with any organized rhythm. And if you find yourself thinking that what you see on the monitor should be producing a pulse and it's not, that's PEA. We follow the same algorithm as asystole, but our focus is entirely different. We start out the same with good CPR and epinephrine as soon as possible, but with PEA our management must be focused on identifying the cause and correcting it if possible, and we need to do so very quickly. This is where you consider the H's and T's. This list of 11 things is daunting for some to memorize, but I'm going to simplify this greatly for you by focusing on the things we can actually do something about in a pre-hospital cardiac arrest setting, and you will see there are only a couple specific things you need to consider. I'll start by crossing the things off the list that we cannot realistically impact. Each of these are on this list because they could absolutely be a cause or contributor to PEA. However, Potassium levels or the presence of toxins are difficult or impossible to assess in the field, and if your patient is in cardiac arrest because of these, we do not have tools in the field that are likely to change that outcome. Similarly, a clot, whether it is in the lungs or the heart, that results in cardiac arrest has most likely progressed beyond anything we can reverse. Finally, cardiac tamponade is a reversible condition if identified early, but in most EMS systems, paramedics are not allowed to perform cardiosynthesis. So let's focus on the ones we can impact. Hypoxia and acidosis are things we can influence. The good news is that the things we do early in our cardiac arrest algorithm, such as good CPR with good ventilation and oxygenation and an advanced airway as soon as possible, provide the support needed in these areas. The next H that we can definitely impact and we need to remember to address is hypovolemia. If you see an organized rhythm and you don't feel a pulse, it is possible that the heart is functioning appropriately, but the patient is hypovolemic. Aggressive fluid administration may result in a perfusing blood pressure. Next is tension pneumothorax. In the setting of trauma, this should be suspected and lung sounds should be evaluated along with other pertinent findings. In the setting of cardiac resuscitation, recognize that the trauma of chest compressions or the positive pressure ventilations we provide could also produce a tension pneumothorax. Remember to reassess lung sounds frequently, and if sounds are absent on one side in the setting of PEA, a needle decompression is warranted. 
Finally, consider hypothermia. If your patient is potentially severely hypothermic, especially in the setting of a cold water submersion or extended exposure to extreme temperatures, a slower and more conservative approach to resuscitation is advised while raising the patient's core temperature. In those settings, what seems to be PEA may in fact be providing some minimal amount of perfusion, and good neurological outcomes have been reported even after extended submersion in cold water. Here's the rapid-fire summary for the non-shockable rhythms. Do good CPR, start an IV, and give epinephrine as early as possible. Do two-minute cycles of CPR and repeat your epinephrine every three to five minutes. If it's asystole, think about terminating resuscitation. If it's PEA, find a cause and treat the ones you can. Oxygenate and ventilate with an advanced airway, administer fluids, assess lung sounds and decompress the chest if needed, and if they're hypothermic, slow down and plan to work it for a while as you warm your patient.